and nasty and disgusting. Same here. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Outdoors with MSA. This is episode 35 with your host, Anthony Jones, and myself, Jonathan Abernathy, and our special guest today, Mike. Mike, how are you? I'm doing well. How about y'all? I'm good, sir. Enjoying this uh, lovely bipolar mother nature. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr. Uh, Professor Mike Chamberlain, uh, thank you for coming on and joining us today. If uh, you could, could you kind of just give us a brief little bio of who you are and, and what you're doing? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Mike Chamberlain. I'm a faculty member at the University of Georgia. Um, I'm a wildlife researcher mostly, and I've been doing this for way too long, I think, now that I think about it. Um, about 20, about 27 years, I guess, 28 years, I've been, I've been a researcher. Uh, before I came to UGA, I actually worked at Louisiana State University for about a decade doing the same type of work that I do now, which is mostly uh, field research, where I train graduate students and we do field research on a number of species, but most of my work these days is on wild turkeys and has been for the past quite a few years, actually. Right. Uh, well, it's no doubt that the turkeys are declining across the southeast. Uh, we had Dr. Grant Woods in here last week talking a little about a uh, little bit about uh, net, uh, brood habitat and ways that landowners could fix it. Uh, but what would consist of nesting habitat? What is a hen turkey looking for as far as where she wants to lay her eggs? Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is, unlike brood habitat, which is pretty specific, nest habitat is, is much broader than a lot of people think. We, If you look at where our GPS marked birds, you know, our telemetry monitored birds, if you see the places they nest in, there's, it's all over the map. It's, it's, um, we see birds that nest in areas that are just super dog hair thick. And we see birds nest in areas that are almost wide open where you can see her sitting there from some distance away. And we don't see any links between what the nest looks like and whether it hatches or not. Um, I know that sounds crazy, but you know, you would think, well, if she's nesting in really thick stuff then she's got a better chance, but we don't see that. We, we see that most nests fail anyway. Um, and it looks like predation is kind of random across the landscape really. Um, but in a general sense, if you look at a lot of nests, there is some minimum vegetation height, just, just enough to hide her. But again, you know, we see the examples that don't fit that template, you know, if you will. And we see some that are literally so thick that she has to tunnel her way into the vegetation. Um, wow. It's really all over the map. Wow. So they just kind of get in where they fit in, where they feel the, the best chance of her. Yeah. And, and one thing that, that we see with turkeys is they, they buffer each other when they nest. In other words, they maintain a distance from other hens on the landscape. They don't, unlike say waterfowl, <laughs> you might have, you know, a pile of ducks nesting around one wetland. You don't mm -hmm. see that with turkeys. They, they, they kind of buffer themselves on the landscape. And what that causes is we think, we think it causes some birds to end up nesting in places that may not be the best because that's what she has available to her. Um, we also see, which is really interesting, that if you look at the day that she starts laying her clutch, and we can, we can identify that, we can determine with the, the GPS data, the first time she visits the nest site. And if you look at her movements the day that she first goes to the, to the nest, she walks by dozens of places that look quote unquote, look just like the nest that she ends up at, which tells us we don't see the environment the way this bird does. We, we don't, we don't see the landscape the way they do, because from our perception, her nest doesn't, her nest site doesn't really look any different than a lot of places that she walks by before she ever puts the egg there, which is kind of interesting. Uh, 
could you tell us what some of the factors are as far as I know there's a broad spectrum of reasons there's a decline in wild turkeys, but could you hit on maybe some of the major ones? Is is it Roundup Ready corn and soybeans? Is it primarily predators, habitat? Or is yeah. it a mixture of all of them? Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, the decline, from my perspective, I, I look at the top, which would be habitat issues. Um, if you look at the landscape from a turkey's perspective and compare it to what it was, say, 30 years ago, it's dramatically different. So things like fragmentation, you know, we've we've broken up the landscape. We've put roads, we've put rights of way. Uh, we've, we've done all these things that fragment the habitat. And that in many ways benefits predators rather than than the prey that they're after we've taken hardwood forest and we've we've either converted them to pine forest or they're just gone uh, and hardwoods are critical for turkeys because that's wintering habitat in the south is hardwood hardwood areas and then you look at the existing you know what's left that's out there is not as well managed as it needs to be um, most turkeys live on private land and you if you kind of look at private land ownership and how that's changed over the past hand you know 10 15 20 years in some areas it's quite a bit different than it, than it was historically larger landowners have become you know groups of smaller landowners um so that's kind of the big picture habitat problem there haven't there haven't been many things that are positive for a turkey in the south habitat wise in the past few decades then kind of confounded with that is the predation issue you know they kind of go hand in hand you can't really talk about predators without talking about habitat because those predators are hunting these same habitats to eat right. um, so if you look at predators that that and are in that are in the south now you know all evidence suggests that they're at a historic apex that their abundance is at a historic high right and of course that doesn't bode well for for turkeys because a lot of those species eat their eggs and some of those species like bobcats and coyotes kill the adults so um so we do see the predation is is pretty high which it's always been high but it it is really high now in, in the southeast we lose about 80 so percent of our nest so what has changed? I know from the time when I started hunting around 95 to about 2005, I mean, seeing a turkey was rare. And then, a, right, and that was in North Carolina, like the Outer Banks region. Mm -hmm. um, and then after about 2005, I was seeing a lot more turkey. What has changed in that time that has now started that decline? Other than yeah. what you've said already, I mean, so yeah, it, I mean, you could say the same thing you've already said, but well, in some it, it cases, was like it boomed and now it's, it's yeah. holding under again. Yeah, that's exactly right. And what you saw in a lot of areas <clears throat> was turkey populations were restored, you know, trapped and tra birds were trapped and transported around various places. They were released. The populations were low. And what you saw is this dramatic increase in turkeys in in many, many areas. And then depending on where you are in the Southeast, you saw populations kind of stabilize. And then suddenly, you know, they've started to decline and the declines are, are consistent across the region. It's not like, you know, one state is not seeing any issue. All the states are seeing an issue to some degree. They're, they're just not tracking each other at, in the same way. In other words, if you look at data from Arkansas, the decline there started before it started in maybe some other states but the declines are, are they're all following the same trajectory they're all following the same trend they're just in different times um so that to answer your question that's what you saw you kind of saw these populations really skyrocket they stabilized and now in in many areas not all but in many areas you're seeing you know these declines and where they are in that spectrum of decline is pretty variable from one state to the next. 
you hit on Arkansas, and I've got friends who live in Arkansas, southeast part of Arkansas, so they mm -hmm. they they see birds a lot. But I have a, a br soon to be brother in law who lives in northwest Arkansas and don't see birds at all. Uh, yeah, and so the decline. It's not just Arkansas, but like Louisiana, you know, those two states are similar. Uh, they're both hurting for birds. Is it attributed to habitat as well there? Or is it something completely different as far as what the rest of the Southeast is doing? No, it's pretty much the same issues. In fact, if you look at, if you look at the trend in Arkansas, there are a number of states that are on the same trajectory that Arkansas has been. They're just, they're farther behind. In other words, um, the declines that you started seeing in harvest, for instance, in Arkansas may have been around, you know, 2005 or so. And then in another state, it may have been in 2010 or 2011, but you're seeing the same, the same issues and in the habitat, the predation issues, they're uniform across the South. You know, we've got disease issues that we don't understand. Uh, in fact, just before I joined y'all, I, you know, I've been in a conversation with a, with a pathologist about about turkey samples that they're they're collecting and, and what they could mean with there's just so much about disease we don't understand and it's hard because a disease sick bird gets killed by a predator and we don't we don't know about it you know and we're seeing that a lot of birds are are carriers for from some for some diseases like viruses that we don't really understand um and then you kind of factor in the which is interesting for turkeys is, you know, we, we harvest this bird during its breeding season, which is, which is different than, than other game birds. We don't, we don't shoot quail while they're in their breeding season. You know, we don't yeah. kill grouse in their breeding. I mean, we, we hunt turkeys primarily in the spring when they're breeding. And, and so harvest is, is important for this bird. And we've known it, that for, for decades. So you kind of factor all this together and you've got, I, I use the analogy, it's like a football field. Um, if you if you were to ask why are turkeys declining or what are the factors that are influencing the declines, look at it from a, a coach's perspective. Look at a football field and, and in any given game, certain positions on the field influence the outcome more than others. So in your part of North Carolina, you may have a couple of players on the field that are more influential to the outcome than you are, than you would see in, in other parts of North Carolina. But all of these positions, all these things we've talked about, they're all influencing the outcome. Um, it's just that some, some games, the, the players are more impactful than others. But the bottom line is we're, the outcome is the same. We're losing more games than we're winning um, because we're just not making as many turkeys as we did, you know, a couple decades ago. So what? does DNR need to take a season or two off from, do, do you feel like the, the recreational hunting of them, like if they were to take a year or two off from that, would that help? Or is it still just going to be that, that decline from predation habitat? Well, you know, agencies are in a tricky situation because they need us out there hunting the bird. You know, there, there's so many positive aspects that go in to sport hunting and, you know, us turkey hunters, we, we're the economic engine. I mean, we, we buy licenses, we buy, you know, ammunition and, and firearms and these things that generate the funding that it takes to conduct wildlife management. So, you know, the agencies are in this tricky balance where they, they want us to be out there. They want us to be able to hunt. They want us to buy licenses and, but they also want and need the resource to be sustain you know, to be sustainable. So, that puts agencies in a tricky situation and I don't, I don't envy their job at all. You know, they, no. you know, they design hunting seasons and fishing, you know, seasons and bag limits and all these things that you and I deal with. They design those trying to balance you and I wanting to go out there and, and chase whatever it is we're chasing and the sustainability of that, of that resource. You kind of hit briefly uh, that the state's, we're kind of doing their own individual thing. Is it, have you maybe talked to the state or maybe work with the NWTF to try to get them to do the studies together as a whole and mm -hmm. share information or are they already doing that? Well, right now 
I, I will tell you, so I've been in this since 1993. I, I started studying turkeys as a graduate student in 93. And I've studied turkeys every year of my career since. And what you saw back in the 90s and in 2000s was I would do a project here in Georgia. You would do a project in North Carolina. Somebody would do a project somewhere else. They would publish the information and move on. And that's okay, but it's not as powerful as the work that's ongoing now. What you're seeing now is a much broader research effort. Um, for instance, you know, I'm, I've got work on about eight or 10 study sites in the Southeast. In, folks at other universities are collecting data the same way that I am and vice versa so that we can compare across state lines where we can make more meaningful recommendations to agencies. And I, I, I gave a presentation the other week at the NWTF convention where I mentioned this, that for us to reverse these, these trends, we're going to have to work across state lines. We're going to have to work through political boundaries and understand that turkeys are turkeys, no matter whether they live in your state or my state. And we need as much information as we can get. And we need to be, to your point, we need to be able to provide the agencies with the best data. And sometimes, you know, what's going on in my state is very similar to your state. Well, I'll give you my information and, and let you use it to, you know, to make whatever, you know, changes to land management or harvest or whatever in your state. Um, I'm really seeing a lot of that momentum now, and that's good. That's a good thing. It, it, it's basically middle school science, right? You have to have a control. When you're doing any kind of research, you have to have a control. If you're all studying them different ways, your results are going to vary. You well, and, yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been asking, you know, the states, as you know, I mean, y'all know how this functions. I mean, state yeah. politics are politics, you know, so you have, you have, one state that collects information a certain way and you have another state that collects it a different way. But over the past decade, you I've seen in a lot of movement towards standardizing how we do things, whether it's uh, collecting information, reporting information the same way so that we can compare apples to apples, you know, right. and it's an ongoing process. As you, I mean, as you can imagine you, when you're trying to ask agencies to change the way they're doing things or to ask people like me that, you know, academics and researchers that have been doing something a certain way for, for a decade or more to change, you know, that doesn't happen overnight, but, but I'm seeing a lot of momentum to make that happen. And I'm seeing some positive changes um, from both people like me and from agencies. And that's a, that's a positive. One of our viewers is from Rhode Island, and he asked the question is, how stable is the population in the Northeast? And do you see it going the same trend as the Southeast is doing? Yeah, things in the Northeast are, are different in some ways and, and similar in some ways. Some of the issues with production, with the decline in production, those have been noted in some of the, the Northeast states as well. Um, the, some of the differences you see in the Northeast versus the southeast one um the the hunting regulations are, are quite a bit different in the northeast uh two you have a lot of areas of the northeast where you have urban suburban type birds right that basically aren't hunted um mm -hmm. and you, you basically what you see is you know turkeys that are we think probably are behaving a little different and they're exposed to different predation risk than they are down here in the Southeast. Okay. Um, there's been a lot of work done and, and there's actually some ongoing work now in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania and some surrounding states that they're doing the same type of G GPS marking that I am. And we're actually collecting uniformly, collecting data the same now so that I can compare my work in the Southeast to Pennsylvania and some of the Northeast states and vice versa. And we've got collaborators in the Midwest that are doing the same thing. So that now all of a sudden we have almost range wide data, at least for the Eastern subspecies on how this bird's behaving and, and what 
you know, some of these vital rates like nest success and brood survival and that type of thing, what those rates are, you didn't see that even a handful of years ago. I mean, there have been some large studies, um, particularly in the Northeast, actually collaborative type studies, but until we started seeing these declines, there was, there was somewhat of a hesitant hesitancy to enter into those big projects. And now that's kind of, that's kind of the norm, which I think is great. Um, Good. definitely a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. What is some of the tools that you use to monitor your birds as part for your study? Yeah. So we, we catch them in the winter. We, we wrapped up trapping season a few weeks ago. We, we catch them in winter flocks, uh, with rocket nets. Uh, the work that we, we do on Rio's, we use a lot of drop nets where it's just a net that's suspended up on poles and it drops over the birds. Easterns are, are too skittish to walk under a drop net. So rocket nets that are covered on the ground that are deployed over their backs. Uh, so we catch the bird, we put a leg band on it. We put just like, a, you know, a duck or, or something. We put a leg band on it. We collect blood um, from a, the brachial vein under the wing that allows us to look at disease, to look at genetics. Uh, we put a GPS little backpack on their back that's that's it sits just like you would, you know, if you were to put a really tiny little backpack on yourself right in the center of your back, that's what it looks like. Okay. Um, it, it's got a GPS unit inside of it, collects locations. We collect a location every hour uh, on the bird all day, and then we collect a roost location at night so we know where they roost every night. And can I get one of those? What's that? <laughs> Can I get one of those? It would help me out. Twelve hundred bucks, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. They're not, they're not as cheap as your your handheld Garmin, you know, that you buy out at the the local store. But right. And basically, what we do is we we have these um, we have these almost like handheld radio units that you use to remotely download the data from the from the GPS that's on the bird. So we never touch. We don't have to catch the bird again. We actually don't ever have to see the bird again. We just get a fairly, you know, a few hundred yards from it, which we do using standard radio telemetry, just signals and beeps. And we turn this unit on. It sucks all the GPS locations off of the transmitter that's on the bird's back. And we go on and we just do that routinely. And so therefore, you know, every few days we were, we download more data and we've got a pretty accurate picture of where the bird went, how far they moved, where they roosted, where they nest, where they take their broods, uh, interactions from, you know, amongst birds. Um, there's just a ton of information that you can get from those units. And now we have, uh, the units have accelerometers on them so we can see which which you can see these very fine movements. Like we can see when the bird flies down out of the tree, we can see when the bird flies up into the tree, when a hen that's nesting gets up to walk away, we can see her do that. Um, we think we're going to be able at some point to figure out when a bird is strutting or gobbling. Oh, that's and cool. Yeah, it is. I, I'm, I'm so excited. Uh, right. I wish this stuff had come about years ago when I was younger. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so have you guys I, ever, have you ever had like a camera, like an eagle's nest cam on a, on a turkey nest throughout the whole duration of the, you know, the clutch and then through hatch? Yeah. Yeah. I don't do that type of work. Um, turkeys, there has been work done like that, looking at nest predation and, you know, the types of predators that visit the nest. Um, I actually have a buddy of mine who um, in he had a bird nest in his backyard in the Northeast and he put a like a surveillance camera on her nest and got some really cool data on, you know, she would get up and leave the nest and another bird would come and sit on it, um, which we know turkeys do, which is interesting. Turkeys are strange, particularly Eastern. Rio's a little less so, but you have to be careful approaching a nest and you have to be careful disturbing the nest. They're, they're bad to abandon the clutch. You know, if you spook her off and she's only been incubating for a few days, sometimes they just don't come back. Really? So, 
so we try i tried I, all of my work is 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 focused around minimizing the impact we have on the bird and doing camera work at nest you just have to be real careful right okay so we have a few questions that i want to get to that people have asked um one to ask do the turkeys with the gps packs get a pass on being hunted no no and it actually when the bird when the bird approaches you you'd have to be looking to know it's even got a gps on it um some of the pack packs are a little different some are a little lighter colored than others but you know if the bird is just walking to you if he doesn't turn around where you can see his back you'd have no you'd have no idea that the bird was marked um and actually we don't want to protect the birds that are that are marked we want hunters to you know we want to see what happens to these birds so we want to we want to be able to see for instance how they interact with hunters we've done work where we actually had hunters carry gps units in their pocket and we looked at how they interacted with with toms that were gps marked so oh, we, awesome. we, want the, we want the marked birds to be shot you know if, if the hunter wants to shoot the bird shoot the bird yeah, yeah. and then another one is do you think bait piles for deer harm the turkeys by spreading disease yeah that's a tough question there there's a lot of research on looking at this now um and i, I won't i won't go in to work that's not mine, but I will just say from what I've seen, there there is some evidence that if the if the bait is there and it's piled up and it sits for days on end and it's not consumed and the temperatures are hot, that there there could be some disease concerns that would affect poults in particular, uh, less so adults, but poults in particular. Um, and that work, some of that work, I believe, is about to be published. I, I saw a presentation of it back in the summer, and I believe the, the student that's doing that work is, is supposed to finish up soon. So hopefully it will be out there, you know, for people to see. Now, quick question. You, you talk about these GPS backpacks. Are, are they designed to fall off after a certain amount of time, or does the bird carry it the rest of its life until you trap it again? No, they fall off. They, the, they, they're tied on. If you, you know what a parachute cord is, um, mm -hmm. they're tied on with like a, a parachute type cord, and it has a, it has a rubber core on the inside of it, and that rubber, which kind of allows it to give a little bit, and that rubber rots through time. So after a few years, the unit will start to fray, the, the transmitter cord will start to fray, uh, the tubing dissolves, it breaks down, which puts more pressure on the webbing that's on the outside of the, the tubing, and eventually it just breaks and falls off. Um, we have caught birds, you know, several years later that had G, GPS still, had, you know, backpacks still on them that weren't working, but usually after a few years, if you catch the bird again, the backpack's gone. Um, and it, who knows where it's, you know, it's laying in the woods somewhere. Um, but yeah, a few years it falls off. Okay. So it's not something that you could just continuously reuse. It's like a one done deal. It is unfortunately. Yeah. It's, it, you know, once you deploy them and if you get them back, even they're a paperweight, you know, they're, they're no good. Um, so it, it costs money to do this type of work and, you know, these GPS and these, a lot of the things that we use, you know, they're disposable products that we have to purchase repeatedly every year. How, if some, so, say one of our viewers wanting to uh, donate to you or donate to your science team, how could they go about doing that? Yeah, we, I get donations periodically. Um, what I, what I do is, I, I had the university set me up a, an account where donors can contribute money and it goes into this turkey research account. Um, some donors will actually send money and they want it to go to a specific project. Like uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, recently, a person reached out to me on social media and said, 
I'd like, I'm really interested in this particular study that y'all are doing. Can I contribute some money to it? And, and I said, absolutely. Yes. So what, what he did, um, is he just, I had him write a letter when he mailed the check and said, you know, put in the letter that you want this money spent specifically for this project and it will go into a specific account. And, and a lot of people do that. Um, some people awesome. don't care. They just, they're, they're interested in the broader research and they, you know, they'll email me and, or message me on social media and say, Hey, I'd like to contribute some funding. What do I do? And, and I just engage with them, you know, through social media or through my email, which you can, um, you can find on the university of Georgia's homepage. If you just search on my name, you can find my email and, or if you go on social media, you know, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook, I'm easy to find as well. So, yeah, I mean, donations are great and, and donations are great for many reasons, not just the fact that it takes money to do this stuff, but donor funds are, are unrestricted. And what that means is uh, they can be used to, to do things that come up out of the ground, as it, if, if you will, such as four wheeler breaks down and there's no money in a contract. You know, I work under contracts with state agencies and those contracts have very specific budgets in them. As you can imagine, I can spend X number of dollars on this. I can spend X number of dollars on that. They're very restrictive and sometimes things go wrong and we have to replace something, you know, a four wheeler or a laptop blows up or, you know, you name it. it, it we work outside mm -hmm. all year and we're working in sometimes pretty difficult conditions and we, it's hard on gear. It's hard on, you know, all your stuff that you're using out there and things have to be replaced. And sometimes we don't have funding to replace some of these things. That's where donor funding comes in because I, I have some flexibility there to spend it. So is there any type of information that you would be looking like, let's say our viewers are running trail cams and they start seeing some weird behavior. Um, would you ever want people to send that to you so you could see like if I'll buy oh, a turkey I get, here? Yeah. I get it. I get, I probably conservatively, I would say I get, uh, probably 10 or 15 messages a day from people through social media or to a lesser extent by email with pictures of turkeys or video of turkeys or, you know, Hey, what's this bird doing? Uh, Hey, I saw, you know, look at this bird in this pic trail camera picture. What, you know, what's, what's up with the color of its feathers or what's up with, you know, this or that. Yeah. People can absolutely contact me and send me pictures and, and I'll, I'm responsive as I can be. I, I sometimes right, right. can't respond to everything, particularly on social media. Mm -hmm. It's just overwhelming. But, but emails, I'm, I'm, I'm better at um, because I can type on my keyboard faster right. than I can on my phone. Uh, I've seen okay. a bird before with what they call the avian pox. I, I guess that's what it is. Mm -hmm. is, is there? Have we figured out what causes it? And is there a way to prevent it outside? I know it's very contagious to other turkeys. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's transmitted by biting, you know, insects. And um, avian pox is, you know, is something that's out there all the time. We, we see it. If you look at disease work, it's not uncommon to see birds every year in certain areas with pox lesions on their head. And a lot of those birds survive. Um, really? Yeah, they'll they'll actually shed the the lesions, you know, after the year, and they look normal the following year. But it it can be fatal. And one thing that we're seeing with pox um, quite a bit now, and we don't understand it, is that a lot of birds that are testing positive for avian pox are also testing positive for a virus that has a long name, and I I won't bore you with it, but. Uh, the bottom line is this virus is is kind of an unknown. There's a lot of research. In fact, I have a, I have a call on Thursday with some uh, veterinary folks here about this virus because it looks like it it's pretty common out there, and we don't know much about it. Um, so 
to, to your point, yeah, pox can be problematic. And um, although a lot of birds do survive, you do see every year, you'll see little pockets in the Southeast where you'll get a bunch of birds reported with pox. Uh, in fact, 20, let's see, COVID year was 2020. The spring of 2020, there was a little pocket out in Western North Carolina to, to your North Carolina point where I, I got a number of calls from people that were seeing birds that had lesions on their head in one county, you know, and that that's all that's pretty typical. You'll see that a lot. Okay. Yeah. Have you see, done now, any now I'm in oh go ahead, Andrew. Have you done any studying on Osceola's down in Florida? No, but we're hopeful that I'm actually trying to work with some actually with some private donors and some other groups now to get some work started in Florida. Um we'll, it wouldn't be run through me directly. It would actually be run through the University of Florida, but that that's ongoing. There's a lot of interest in Osceola's, as, as you know, um, and Osceola's, the, the interesting, I, th I think they're, um, I think they're the poster child for turkeys in general, because if you look at the Florida Peninsula and how it's changing and how it's going to continue to change, Osceola's are looking at a future where if they're not prioritized like other things, their future is, is problematic in areas because so much is, I mean, if you look at, if you look at Florida, the, you know, land's being taken, it's a destination state for retirees. You've got storms and these things that impact the Florida peninsula a lot. You have all these things that are ongoing, you know, conflicts over water and water quality and, and land use, it's just on and on and on. And then you have this bird that lives there and it doesn't live anywhere else. Yeah. <laughs> um, so everything's already stacked against it. Why add more? Yeah, yeah. And but but there's so much interest in in Osceola. <laughs> and the positive one positive is that a lot there are a lot of large landowners in Florida that prioritize turkeys. And I think yeah. if we can if we can make more people down there prioritize turkeys or at least put turkeys up there in their priority list to where they're they have equal share with some other competing land use practices then i think you know the future is is good for them good you can ask your question now john i'm sorry so i'm no longer in north carolina i'm now in northwest georgia up in okay the, the uh Katusa area okay um have you ever been to a WMA up there, Croxford Pigeon Mountain area? I have, yeah. Okay. That's probably where I'm going to try to go hunt this year for Georgia birds. Uh, any population thing that you can tell me? They, they look decent population-wise, or is it just crapshoot? Well, I mean, the that part of the state up in north, you know, the north part of the state, from a production standpoint, often does better than other parts of the state. Um, you see, you know, not always, but you do see some years that production is better, you know, in the north part of the state. You know, as you know, I mean, if you're up there, it's just such a different landscape. It's so rugged. Um, and it, you know, turkeys are facing some unique challenges up that way too, in that we just don't manage forest in the mountains anymore there's very little management of the forest and, and you know timber harvest you don't see a you know timber harvest strategies in a lot of areas like you used to see and so you see a lot of closed canopy wide open you know type forest and and that's just not ideal habitat for not just turkeys but you know deer in north georgia are dealing with the same issues uh the turkeys yeah. are and what I have seen with the deer population, I'm not the biggest turkey hunter. Anthony here is our resident turkey guy. Um, what I've noticed with the deer here in North Georgia compared to where I go 45 minutes north in Tennessee, the Mount Eagle area, the one, the deer are bigger up there. Their antler growth is more. It, it's almost like they're just not getting enough nutrition from the browse around here to grow decent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's actually an, there's a, pretty broad study ongoing through UGA now on the North Georgia deer populations because they they have declined pretty, you know, pretty markedly through the last 
you know, handful of years. And we see, I, I say we, it's not my project, but the project is showing pretty high predation rates. Um, you know, if you just walk around and look, there's a, a lack of cover, there's a lack of browse. There's, you know, it's just not ideal deer habitat in a lot of places. And deer are kind of like turkeys in the way that in those types of forests, they need some disturbance. You know, they need some type of forest disturbance to stimulate understory vegetation. And there's just not as much of that as there used to be. And the only place I've really seen both in good numbers, you can't hunt, which is probably why the numbers are higher, but the Chickamauga battlefields, they're mm -hmm. just overrun with deer and turkey. They're, they're everywhere. You can't drive through there without almost hitting one. Mm -hmm. um, so it it's like those little pockets of well-managed area are, are doing well, but yeah. like the Crocsford Pigeon Mountain, it's such a rugged terrain and there's it's not been managed very well. And I'm not trying to say yeah. that they're doing a bad job at managing it. They're doing what they can with the resources they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, you, you can tell the difference. And those two places are only 30 minutes apart from each other. Sure. And the numbers are so drastic. Yeah, absolutely. We have a, <clears throat> a viewer that's asked, are there any places that the populations are stable or rising? He says, I hunt the West Virginia mountains and turkeys seem to be doing better than th there than any time that he can ever remember. The yeah, there are there are pockets. Yep, there are pockets in the all over the species range where you see populations doing doing OK. Um, and there's actually, you know, some areas where when you when you look at the data, you know, harvest is increasing and things look good. Um, it's just that we don't have as many of those areas as we used to. Right. Um, so the, the the bright spots on the landscape are are outweighed by the dark spots. In, in most parts of the, the eastern part of the range anyway. Um, but West Virginia, actually, yeah, there are, I, I have several colleagues that, that own property in West Virginia, and, and they report the same thing, that in places that they frequent and visit, the populations seem to be fairly stable, um, which is a good thing, positive yeah. for sure. Yeah, I, we have a pretty decent population here in Tennessee, but if you go one county over, it used to be one of the largest harvested counties for turkeys, and they're almost non-existent, which is Franklin County. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There wasn't nothing to get 500 birds a year killed there, and now you're lucky if you get 150, 200. Yeah, yeah. And that's what you see. You, you really see some, you know, in, in a lot of states, you can identify places like you just said that were once a historic stronghold that no longer are. <clears throat> And you see some, you know, some states where, like in here in Georgia, you know, the Piedmont region was the bread and butter for turkeys and has been for, for decades. And that's where you see pretty precipitous declines, you know, or in, in this broad swath of Georgia where things looked good, you know, 15 years ago. And, they're, and although there are still some bright spots in that region, they're not as bright as they used to be. That's kind of the general trend that we've seen. So is it more of a sky is falling or is it just an ebb and flow? It might be down now, but in 10 years, it might be back up. And what, what are we looking at really? That's a, I, no, it's not a sky is falling thing. It's just, you know, I think, I think we're in a new normal and I don't think we're going to come out of it per se to where we were at some point. In other words, I don't, I don't think there's any chance that we will see populations go back to where they were, say in 2000. I just, yeah. because the landscape is so different, right? you know, and, and society is different. You know, we, there's more people, there's, I mean, the, there are so many competing uses for habitat for not just turkeys, but for every critter. And our society is just, it's changing so much and our world is changing. I just don't see the landscape reverting to what it was. So I think we're probably in a new normal and that's not necessarily a terrible thing. It's just, we need to understand where that is and right. we need to understand how to your point, to your question, what does the future look like? 
what should the future look like? What are our expectations for what turkey population should be 20 years from now or 50 years from now? Yeah. And that's, you know, that's that's something that we're struggling to understand. I mean, that's why we're doing so much research is, okay, well, where are we at really? And more importantly, where are we going to be a decade down the road if we leave things just status quo, if we change this, if we change that, you know, and, and a lot of my work where we're collecting reproductive data, you can predict where we're going to be. I mean, if we keep seeing the type of production we're seeing, where are we going to be a decade from now? And that's, you know, that's the information the agencies look at. And that has them either making changes as they can make changes, or it has them asking more research questions. Okay, well, given what we're seeing here, why is that happening? And what could we do to, you know, to resolve it? And you're that, and that is why you're seeing so much research across a lot of the U.S. now, is because there's a recognition that we don't know what the future holds, and we need to to collect information so that we can predict predict out. Yeah, Where do and you I'm, see I'm glad that all the research is going because what I what I fear is just the normalization of it all. Like. In my generation, I'm used to seeing X amount of birds. Well, my kids' generation, they'll get normal, but they'll get used to seeing a normal amount of birds, and it just keeps declining. And it, yeah, I don't want that. I want it to to stay strong. Yeah. Where do you where do you see our talk, uh, turkey population within the next ten years or twenty? I really think it's going to depend. I think what you're going going to probably see is that. In some areas, they'll they'll continue doing well if they're doing well, and you'll probably see some areas where they're going. The population is going to decline to some level, and it's going to stay there. Uh, I hope that we don't have that. That's not most <laughs> most areas, but it, it, that's going to happen in some areas where the population is just going to decline, and it's going to get to some low level. And it's going to stay there, or which I think is actually happening more often than we think, is they're disappearing from some areas. Mm -hmm. um, birds are just not in places where they were, and I hear this from people all over the country. Actually, I don't have turkeys, and I used to, or I'm seeing half as many as I did ten years ago. Uh, I think what you'll probably see is those places, some of those areas will stabilize, some will decline further. Hopefully some will actually kind of go to, to John's point, they will start to ebb up again. And, and actually, that we know that happens anyway in wildlife populations. I mean, we know that there are ebb and flows and, you know, and what drives turkey populations is production. So right. if you produce a lot of poults, things start on the upswing and actually there are you know i know some places within states this past this you know this past year 2021 where production was was a little higher than it had been well that's good you know could that mean that we're those areas are headed out of that abyss maybe um we just have to keep collecting the information and and disseminate it to people as we get it and and hopefully we right. can answer those questions about you know where are we headed right it, uh, you know what? What's the number of poults that needs to hatch and be successful uh, for our turkey population to remain the same or to increase? Well, we kind of we as a as kind of the turkey science group in a world, if you will, have have always kind of thought that two poults per hen as indexed in the summer. So in other words, for every hen you see, you see two poults. We've always kind of assumed that was necessary to keep a population stable because right. then at a minimum, she's replacing herself. You know, each right. hen is replacing herself with a female. Um, and we don't see two poults per hen in most of the Southeast right now. We're, we're seeing poult per hen ratios that are less than two, indicative right. of a decline. Right. Um, we've always thought that three poults per hen would be about where you'd want to be 
to keep your population either, you know, slightly growing, if you will. So if you oscillate it around three, you know, 2.5 one year, 3.5 one year, 2.6, 3.1, you know, that type of thing, then you would kind of have this population that was doing well. Okay. And you'd have to go back many years to find a state in the Southeast where bolts per hen were over three. It, it, it was many years ago. I, I'm thinking back to the beginning of deer season when we had our cameras out and we were seeing hens with poults and I'm trying to think of how many were with them. <laughs> there was like and, four. <laughs> it's right, because we had, we had did that food plot and yeah. they had all went out there to go eat the, the grain. And there was, there was quite a few, but there was multiple hens. So it was hard to tell how many poults per hen there were. The yeah, and, and so what you see there, so the way the states, the states that collect that that information, you would count the total number of hens that you see, with and without poult, and the total number of poults you see, because what happens is what you just mentioned is they, these broods they 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 amalgamate, they get together with each other. Mm -hmm. So like you said, you'll see you know three hens and twenty poults. So at that point. You don't know how many of those poults are with each hen, and it doesn't really matter. It would just be, you know, three and twenty type of thing, and um, that's a common behavior in turkeys. That, as an aside, we think is related kind of the safety and numbers, and it makes sense. You know, if broods are very specialized. They need certain types of habitat. They need certain vegetation. They they need insects. So if you need these things that are very specific, it makes sense to spend time with other birds on the landscape that also have those exact same needs. Right. Kind of makes Safety sense. Safety in numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is it possible, is, have you had any studies where a hen will go to another hen's nest, lay her eggs and walk off and never come back or? Yeah, yeah, they yeah. parasitize each other. Yeah, we've okay. known that for years. They, uh, we, if you look at genetics work, you'll see clearly that their uh, parasitism is is common. It's not uncommon to have, say, ten eggs in a clutch and one egg, you know, ten are from one hen and one one egg is from another hen. Um, is there a reason why they do that? Well, there are, there are some reasons why, and we don't understand exactly how all of this works but there's a couple of things one you tend to see that parasitism is more common in birds that have high predation rates okay and that makes sense if you think about it from the standpoint of if i'm running okay. a high risk of failing i'll go put an egg in somebody else's basket okay. and maybe don't put all your eggs in one basket yeah yeah um <laughs> there's also this notion that you know, if you go put your egg somewhere else, you're not doing the work. It, it frees you of the risk, if you will. Um, but with turkeys, what we see is the hens that are parasites also nest on their own. So okay. it's not like they're just dumping eggs everywhere. They they tend to, you know, lay one or just a couple of eggs in the, another hen's clutch, and then they nest their own clutch. Um, that's an interesting topic area. And I actually have a student that's studying this. Well, I will have a student that's studying this. We're, we're looking at um, that the eggs that hatch when they hatch, they, they have that egg, that membrane inside the egg. Mm -hmm. Well, that egg, that membrane has DNA from the pulp, but it also has DNA from mom and dad. Cool. So, so we can look at parentage within these clutches that hatch and we can figure out how many hens are represented, how many toms are represented in each clutch, because we know that that multi parentage is common in turkeys. In other words, research has clearly shown that you have a clutch of eggs. There could be two or three toms represented in that clutch because these hens will breed with more than one bird. Right. So we know that's common. We just don't know how common it is. Awesome. After this, I need to call my guidance counselor and really lay into her about the not telling me I could have went to school for this. Um, <laughs> well, there's no money in it. <laughs> there, there was no money in it. It's there was fun. no real money in the military either. I did now, if you're not making, you know, a 
a lot of money you can't even afford to drive. So I guess, yeah. 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 What can landowners do? <laughs> uh, you know, not every landowner has a hundred acres, 300 acres, you know, but from the smallest landowner, say five, 10 acres to the largest, what can they do to help restore the habitat as far as for raising? Yeah. I, I usually tell people when they ask me this, whatever impact you can have, whatever footprint you can influence, try to influence it. So if you, if you have 10 acres, you know, turkeys aren't spending the t their year on right. 10 acres, but um, go talk to your neighbor and see if their 20 acres or their 50 acres or whatever, if they would be willing to let you help them manage it. Right. Um, if you don't own any property, but you have family that does or a buddy or friends or whatever, and you think you could influence their management, try it. Try to have an impact on whatever footprint you can influence and understand that it doesn't have to be swinging for the fences. It can be, it can start with modest efforts. And I, I have personally found that to be much more successful with landowners who they just, they're overwhelmed. If you, if you tell them, okay, you need to thin your timber to this basal area. You need to start burning every three years. You need to do this with your pasture. You need, and they just like, oh my gosh, you know, I can't do all of this. Start with one objective. Mm -hmm. uh, I have too much basal area. My forest is too thick. I own 20 acres. Well, I'm not going to get a logger in here to thin 20 acres. Right. But would my neighbor who has the same looking forest, would my neighbor entertain having his or her timber thinned? And if so, now I have 80 acres. I'm just pulling numbers out. Now I have right. 80 acres of timber to thin. Now I can get a logger in here to do that. That's a. It seems daunting to some people, but I have found in my experience that if you provide people with information and the information's out there, if you provide people with information and you incentivize them to make a change, a lot of people will make a change. Right. They, you just have to incentivize them to do it and, and give them the information and not hit them over the head with it, but just pre present the information to them and in a way where they're engaged a lot of people will make, they will do wise management on their property if they know the tools are out there to do it and they're incentivized to make it happen. I have one more question. I watched a show with you on the hunt in public. Okay. And you had gobble monitors. Yeah, yeah. With your study of the gobble monitors, you as a hunter, me as a hunter, we love to hear turkeys gobble. That's why mm -hmm. we hunt. What would you find it better if, uh, you know, if we started seasons maybe towards the end of the breeding season? Where here in Tennessee, I feel like we start right at the peak of it. In, in Kentucky, I feel like it's already past the peak and it's starting to, you know, they're starting to gobble less. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you think that would play a different role? Or why I feel like Kentucky has a better bird population than we do. Well, we actually have a project that's about to start in Kentucky, so we'll have <laughs> gobbling data in central Kentucky anyway. Starting, I recommend going to Trigg County. You I'm actually it. honestly not sure what county this work is in. It's actually being conducted through Tennessee Tech, but okay. I'm, I'm a collaborator on the project. But to your question, what we see across you know, these, they're song meters, those, those units are song meters. And basically they, they, they listen to all ambient sound mm -hmm. and then we extract the gobbles out. Um, and basically what we see is it, it, across most of the South, you see this ramping up of gobbling in March. Um, we start collecting the data March the 1st. And what you generally see is this, this increase, steady, steady increase through time. And then, um, depending on when the hunting season starts, you see this decline if pressure's high. Right. If pressure's not as high, you, you, you see some declines, but then you kind of see these recoveries where the data bump around up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, 
we also see that on non-hunted sites, so we're doing this work on a non-hunted site uh, in South Carolina, you don't see any of that. What you see is the a bell curve or the gobbling ramps up and then tails off. So, really? yeah. So what, so we're collecting gobbling on a bunch of different sites. And the reason we're doing that is to answer the question that you just asked is, okay, what does gobbling look like across these states, across broad areas from north to south? What does it look like? When, when are these peaks? If there are any, um, when are they? Because we know that what turkeys do is as hens become receptive and they are, they're starting to breed, which like here in Georgia, we're, we're March the 16th and breeding is, is starting to ramp up. We've got, you know, hens are starting to become receptive. You're starting to see these smaller groups of hens with toms now, uh, where you may have say four or five hens and you got a couple of bird, you know, a couple of toms with them. That's these breeding groups that's starting to, to occur and gobbling is really ramping up. And, we, and that's what you're supposed to see. As hens become receptive, you see this competition really increase amongst toms where they're talking a lot. And then as hens start going into the laying sequence where they're ovulating, they're laying eggs, but they're still receptive, they're still breeding. Um, you see a huge spike in gobbling activity right then because time's running out if you think about it she's laying she's about to be incubating and at that point she's no longer going to be receptive yeah. so when a lot of your hens enter into the laying sequence which they do you know in early april in parts of the deep south and later in april as you move farther north you see a lot of of gobbling activity and then it kind of declines and, and ebbs and flows if you will where some days it's really good and some days it's not. And you and know, I, we see this all the time when we're hunting, you know, one day it's great. The next day, the weather's the same and they're, they're not gobbling. Some of that is just changes in testosterone levels. And some of that, you know, a lot of things can influence gobbling, whether it's weather, you know, harvest. I mean, we know that vocal birds get shot sometimes. So you may be <laughs> less gobbling. Some other birds that are still out there that are alive don't gobble as much. Um, but to your point, that's kind of why we're collecting the data is, is so that we can show agencies, this is kind of what it looks like in your part of, you know, in your state or this part of your state. And then, okay, well, given that's what it looks like, are we out there when a lot of gobbling is occurring? And I'll give you an example. On one study site in South Carolina, we actually saw as, many, as much gobbling after the season as we did before the season. Really? Uh, yeah. And that's really interesting because there are fewer toms out there after the season than there were before the season. If you think yeah, about it, um, the, the difference in that we think in that in that part of that study was that the population was doing really well. So um, there were a lot of turkeys out there. And even though there were some harvested, the, the bigger picture didn't really change. Um, but in other populations that are heavily hunted, we tend to see, like I said, that when gobbling really ramps up and, and hunting starts, whenever that is, doesn't really matter when that is, you start seeing these, these declines in gobbling activity, um, which again, is, it's not that all birds are being shot. It's just that some vocal birds are being shot, some are being spooked, and some birds are just not gobbling as much, which is kind of what you and I see, you know, when we go hunt. Do you think that is because of evolution? You know, turkeys are evolving. You know, if I gobble my head off, I'm going to get shot. Or do you think it's just a smart bird? I think it, I mean, it, it's just a reaction to predation risk. Yeah. You know, turkeys, you know, they, they see us. I have a student finishing up something right now for his, his, his PhD dissertation on this topic where he very clearly shows changes in behavior relative to predation risk. You know, this bird perceives risk, whether it's from a, an owl or from a coyote or from a man or woman. Right. And the more we, we put risk out there, the more they react to it. Right. And if you, if you think about it, that, that makes complete sense. If you, you know, if you're, 
you're in risky situations, you either remove yourself from that risky situation or you change your behavior to where you're not drawing as much attention to yourself. Right. And there's research on a bunch of species showing this, that if it's really risky out there, you either go to somewhere where it's not as risky or you change your behavior in a way to where you can still live in that risky place and not have as much risk. Okay. Um, like, like my bucks going nocturnal every time the season starts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and in the turkey world, what that translates to what we've seen is I'm going to not gobble as much. When I do gobble, I'm going to gobble from the tree. Uh, once I fly down, I'm, I shut up and I do different things such as go to areas where hens are, where I know they're going to be. I may strut and, and, and drum more. I may not do that either. Um, they move away from roads. That's something we've clearly seen that they move away from, from where we access land, right. whether that's a road, a fire break or whatever, as the hunting season progresses, birds will move farther away from those areas. And when hunting season stops, they go right back to acting the way they did before it started. Oh, wow. So clearly the bird perceives risk and reacts accordingly. You know, whether you call that a smart bird or not, I think it's just, you know, you know, turkeys are like other critters. They're wired to do two things, breed and not die. Right. And, you know, they're in, in our, in what we're talking about here, the, the not dying part becomes a critical part of their, their DNA, if you will, because right. they're being exposed to a lot of risk while they're breeding. Right. So it you can't breed if you're dead. Right. So it, it makes yeah. sense that that they would react to pressure during such a critical part of their life, because if they don't breed successfully, at, at least from a male, if they don't breed successfully, they never existed. Right. So that's what I, I don't think about it as a smart bird. Mm -hmm. I think about it as just making a living, you know? Yeah. So before we get too far removed, when we were talking about the uh, land management and how to help your land, Somebody wanted to know, do you have any recommend, like what books do you recommend with information on that? So if somebody wanted to learn more. Yeah, there, the, there aren't books per se that, that I would direct you to what I would, what I would tell or people. Websites or... Yeah. I would tell people, you know, whatever state you're in, you have some resources that are available to you, whether you know, at the click of a button, whether it be your state agency. Um, most state agencies have biologists that will assist private landowners with management plans. You have your local forestry commission, your state forestry commission that will assist you with, with timber and forest management plans. They will help you with prescribed burning plans. Um, you have the Natural Resources Conservation Service in each state. You can reach out to them and get technical assistance with land management in a variety of ways. And you can even, you know, work with them to do cost share programs where if you're interested in, for instance, I had a landowner here that wanted to take some, some pastures and restore them into warm season grasses into something that would be more compatible with nesting and brooding habitat. And he was able to work with, with NRCS to get a cost share to actually share you know, offset some of the expenses of doing that. Um, so there, there are a variety of resources out there to tap into. Um, there's just not a clearinghouse, if you will, for it. Right. If that makes sense, it's it's kind of it's scattered about. But um, if you reach out to your local state agency, the turkey coordinator for that agency should be able to to direct you, like I just did. That hey, go check this out call this person, send this, you know, person an email, whatever the case may be. And, and you can, you can make a lot of headway like that. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Professor Chamberlain for coming in and talking with us today. We, we really Absolutely, guys. Yeah. glad to join you. Yes, sir. Thank yes, you sir. so much. Yep. All right, guys. Well, that'll wrap up episode 35 of Outdoors at MSA. Until next time, be easy.